Hey everyone, welcome back to the DevSec Voice. My name is Erica Dietrich, and today we are bringing you a bonus episode of this podcast specifically for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. During this episode, we're going to be talking to a few different individuals across cybersecurity careers to pick their brains about why did they even go into cybersecurity? Um, what is it exactly that they do? And what did it take for them to get there? I'll intersperse everybody's interviews with questions that the DevNet community ask me on a consistent basis. Hope you enjoy the episode and let's dive in. Today we're hearing from Jose Caro, Information Security Analyst for City of Iowa. Hey, thank you for having me. Greg Bales, Regional Systems Engineer at Fortinet. Thanks, Erica. Taylor Myers Lambert, Information Security Analyst at TSC Security. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you. Adam Kilgore, Technical Marketing Engineer, Technical Leader for Secure Firewall at Cisco. Thank you. Oscar Pineda, Principal Application Security Architect at United Airlines. Happy to be here. And finally, a joint interview with Marcin Kopech, Security Engineering Tech Lead at Cisco, and Raja Sandramorti, Engineering Leader and Cybersecurity Officer for Applications and Platform at Cisco, to get both the individual contributor and hiring manager experience or perspective. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. Yeah, thank yes, you, Erica. I, it's nice to speak with you. <laughs> so I just want to start out with letting you tell your story. What is the story of how you got into cybersecurity and were you always interested? Jose Caro, City of Iowa. If I had to choose one word to describe my path into like cyber and how I ended up in the position that I am, I think I would just say lucky. Uh, and I know a lot of people say, you know, it takes a lot of luck to break into a certain industry. But for my own reason, I think it's just like, like you said, right, the, the journey of getting there. Um, did I always know if this is what I wanted to do? Uh, genuinely, no. I didn't really, you know, understand IT as a career. Um, I've always just kind of seen people, you know, mess around with computers, uh, build them, things like that. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And kind of just didn't know what I wanted to do till I went to a community college and the person who does your scheduling. Uh, thankfully, she loved her job and convinced me to jump into IT classes. Um, okay. Yeah. What were you going to do before IT? I was like last minute going to do auto body and mechanic work. So, oh, man. Yeah. Oh, so you really jumped. <laughs> yeah, completely 180 uh, lifestyle and, and job functions, I guess. Greg Bales, Fortinet. Uh, no, uh, I was all over the board uh, growing up. Thought I was going to be in uh, the theater and film, more artsy stuff. Uh, ended up joining the Air Force uh, just because I didn't have money for college. And uh, they put me into IT. Specifically, I was a network engineer. Um, and so I just got thrust right into that world um, and got to manage a bunch of different environments, uh, long haul circuits, and a whole bunch of different stuff in there. Um, and as I was going through it, I said, hey, this is not bad. I actually kind of like it. It's challenging. Uh, and I have a wife who I need to support. So this is probably a better financial decision. Uh, and I could always do film stuff on the side. And so sometimes I'll make videos and put them on YouTube and whatnot. Uh, but I kind of stayed within IT after that. Uh, and then when I was getting out of full-time uh, Air Force and transitioning into part-time, there was an opportunity to go into cybersecurity, which I'd always wanted to do, but it just never lined up. Uh, so I was able to transition over to that. Um, and that's kind of how I got my official start. Uh, but even as a network engineer, I was doing cybersecurity stuff, uh, whether or not that was assessments uh, and just securing the network. Uh, it was always kind of in the back of my mind. Um, but started the off- always there, even though you didn't get to capitalize on it immediately. Exactly. Yep. So it was always just kind of something that I was saying, hey, if there's something security related, I want to do it. Uh, make sure that I'm the person who gets to do that because any experience is good experience. No, so, absolutely. Yeah. So and that was connect kind the of... dots for me too. So you, you mentioned the military background. I've talked to quite a few folks who were in the military and ended up in cybersecurity in one way or another. Um, oh. is, is there some sort of connection there or is there something about the military that primes you for a cybersecurity career? Uh, I don't know that there's anything in particular that primes you for. I think one thing that was nice for me in cyber security or in the Air Force was that uh, the Air Force kind of just gives you a lot of responsibility right out the door. Uh, so I had, you know, gone through all of my training, took about a year, 
with basic training and technical training. Uh, and I got trained on a crazy amount of things from phones to computers to electrical engineering because they're like, well, there's a lot of things you could get into and these are good foundational things to know. Um, and half of it was irrelevant once I got into the real world. Uh, but that was, you know, what you got trained on. Uh, so, but then, you know, six months into my first job, it was like, all right, you, you now run the network for two bases. Okay. Yeah. And I was like, I shouldn't be doing this probably. Got to learn uh, fast. But no, I, was, I did fine. And yeah, I mean, you just kind of learn through fire. Uh, so I think that that's probably a reason why you might see that. Um, where if you're going through a traditional civilian steps, you kind of have to walk, take a lot more small steps. Um, I never had to go through things like being on a help desk um, mm. and put in years of doing that. And so sometimes feel like, you know, imposter syndrome and like a fraud when it comes to stuff like that. But also at other times, it's just like, well, that is what it is. Yeah. Um, and we all have different ways of getting into whatever we get into. But I do think it was helpful that I was able to do that. Um, it helped that, you know, I had the GI Bill to help pay for my education. So got, you know, used it fully. Got a bachelor's and a master's degree um, in cybersecurity. So I think there, there are multiple reasons why it can be helpful going into the military. Um, and especially because I think a lot of people definitely, you know, in the past couple of years, people have started to really realize, hey, as much as we want this to be an entry level, you know, skill and job, you kind of need a foundation in something IT. Uh, most people cannot just jump right into cybersecurity uh, without connections. So, uh, I mean, getting a really well-defined networking background led to me being able to, you know, hey, I got my niche of network security, and that is what I do and always has been. Even when I became cybersecurity in the Air Force, it was, okay, whenever there's a switch or a router involved, let's go talk to Greg. How does this play? What are the risks that what might happen if something like this were to happen? Explain to us, you know, what does that mean? Because, you know, a lot of people in cybersecurity might be more host and server focused mm. and understand all of that. But they're saying, hey, if there's a vulnerability on a network switch, what is that really? What's the impact? It seems like nothing to me. It's like, oh, well, let's explain what segmentation is, how you can destroy that. Um, so it was really interesting how that continued to play into my career. I, I really like that you touched on the feeling like, like a fraud aspect, too, to be honest, because it seems like a recurring theme as well in cybersecurity with so many of us coming from such diverse backgrounds. And, uh, you know, I hear the, the phrase a lot that, you know, people got lucky or, you know, we're just kind of advised to go that direction. Taylor Myers Lambert, TSC Security. Yeah, firstly, yes, I was always interested in cybersecurity. I would watch a lot of like hacker documentaries and uh that kind of like introduced me to like a lot of things with tech because I don't have a computer science background. I was encoding at like 10, unfortunately, <laughs> like editing like MySpace pages with like HTML and CSS. Like that's I didn't... a lot of us. Were... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. No, were you like that? Just joking. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. So like I first was like introduced to like computer science and all that kind of stuff, like when I was like 21. Um, and it was after I watched like those like hacker documentaries and stuff, but I was okay, like, where do I start? And at the time, and I believe it was like late 2017, there wasn't that many like resources uh, that I could come, that were readily available to me uh, when mm -hmm. it came to like, learning cybersecurity as opposed to coding. So I always call coding like my gateway. <laughs> um, so I taught myself how to code. I used resources like Free Code Camp, Code Academy, uh, Udemy. Nice. And uh, I ended up landing like my first front end developer role. And I started that in 2018. And I was working as a front end developer for some years, but I always knew I wanted to be a security engineer. I just didn't really know like where like I would fit yeah. in security. I didn't um, I didn't have like a solid network of people at the time that could introduce me to different things. I didn't know about how vague that title is, security engineer. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It could be anything. You could be doing AppSec. You could be doing uh, incident response, you know? Right. So, um, I want to say it was around, like, late 2022 to 2023 is, like, when I really got, uh, like, up to speed on security, uh, starting with Try Hack Me. And mm -hmm. I was, like, learning about, like, OWASP Top 10 and just, like, learning about how to secure web apps. So I had learned how to build web apps. And then I was like, oh, uh like learning about how to find vulnerabilities and test different things that I previously didn't know as a front-end developer. 
it was really fascinating for me. Like I didn't know um, the importance of like, uh, of why we should be validating inputs and how that protects against different attacks such as SQL mm -hmm. injections and stuff like that. And um, I just, I was on a Try Hack Me Heavy. I was on Hack the Box. I was on Port Swigger, which is a really good resource for like uh, learning how to exploit and uh, defend against different like, web, like vulnerabilities and stuff. And I was, I wrote a blog post on it and I did try to apply for jobs. I had got, I did get the security plus mm -hmm. uh, that was recommend, like recommended to me heavily. Uh, for those who don't know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is like an entry level uh, certification from CompTIA. Uh, they make a lot of certs that are recommended for people um, for different areas of security and stuff. And um, yeah, I got that. I went to a conference the next day to give a talk on the OWASP top 10 at a security conference. And uh, I was at the job fair and mind you, I don't have a degree. Yeah. And so uh, it wasn't hard for me to get a job, to get jobs in software development without a degree, but boy, like <laughs> when I went to the, uh, the cybersecurity conference, it was very uh, difficult. I got turned down by every company. Uh, wow. Yeah, it was a lot of government tech tech companies and stuff. And they said it was because I don't have a degree, even though I had four years uh, of web development experience at the time. And Interesting. Yeah, no, they they said, how about you come back when you get a degree? And I'm like, I don't know about that. <laughs> like, I think I'm gonna try to find a way. And I mean, obviously I was very discouraged from that, but I kept going. I uh, I had my home labs. I would uh, set up, I would use like Docker, for instance, to help set up like vulnerable like web apps. And I would start like attacking them. Or I also had an Active Directory um, home lab as well. So I could start running like Active Directory attacks like Kerber Roasting and all that kind of stuff. So I was exposed to myself to like network based attacks and web, like, web attacks. And I documented that on my resume. And then one day, I want to say it was in June of last year, I saw that there was an opening for a uh, like, it's a CV analyst role. Mm -hmm. And so another like other titles for that could be like vulnerability researcher. And it was more entry level and that was rare to come across. And it was also remote. And I was like, ooh, <laughs> and, like, you know, it's at this company called SEMGREP and they make uh, secure coding tools. They make SAS tools and also like secret scanners. So a lot of tools that developers use to help uh, secure the code bases, right? So I applied. And I was not expecting to get anything because, like I said, I had just, I was just fresh off of getting all its rejections and stuff. And um, actually, they hit me back and they said that they liked my background and they asked me for an interview. And so I did that and I got the job. And Yay. yeah, so that was the construct role. I was with them for some months, for about six months. And then I took on a vulnerability management role. That was another contract. And then I was fresh off of that. And now I, uh, I kind of took like sabbatical for like two months, like the last two months to like go travel and stuff. And towards the end, I was like, let me just like update my resume and try to apply just to get a feel for the market. Oh, wow. Just low key. Like, <laughs> no, <not laughs> let me just kind of throw a resume out and get a new job. <laughs> no, because I was thinking, I was like, dang, yeah, I was like, I'm gonna need a job. Like when I get back, because I kind of wanted like a little bit of like a break. And I've been studying for like the OSCP. Uh, for like most of this year. So I was like, I, I kind of wanted to like travel um, a bit. And I did get an interview, like a lot of rejections, but <laughs> I did get an interview. Um, that is one thing people should know is that like, it doesn't matter how much like experience you have, like rejections are like pretty inevitable for like everyone at like every yep. level. So you, that's why you gotta be like persistent. But I got the interview and it's for a, a this current job that I have is in a whole different area of, of cybersecurity that I hadn't been, uh, I haven't delved into before. So it's GRC, which is governance, risk and compliance. And so we're helping startups with, uh, with basically um, making sure that they have everything that they need as far as like controls and policies enabled in their organization oh, nice. that they can uh, satisfy like different uh, standards for compliance. So whether that's HIPAA, SOC 2, ISO, um, and so like, it's very new. Uh, I didn't even know much about SOC 2 or anything like that. They really, uh, they were looking for like people that they didn't, it didn't matter if you didn't have a experience in that area, but it was more so like, what is your passion? What can you bring to the table? And mm -hmm. so 
yeah, that's what I've been doing now for a little bit now. Well, I feel like your passion too definitely radiates. Like I'm honestly in awe of the dedication and perseverance of you teaching yourself basically everything that you know. I mean, I know you said you have the certifications, mm -hmm. um, but still, like, I think that's a, such a cool story. And you were giving a talk in cybersecurity before you got hired. Where I got, yeah. That, that's, 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 that to me is wild, but um, that's a super inspiring story. Adam Kilgore, Cisco. Um, for me, it was a little bit more of a meandering path. Um, I got into cybersecurity about 15 years ago, so it wasn't quite as well known and big as it is now. Um, for me, I, I went to college um, in information systems, which is kind of a broad technical and soft skill degree. Um, I had a friend that graduated in it, and I thought it sounded interesting, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. So I got in, I started studying information systems, and then we had one security class in the entire major. And I took the first day of that. Um, my professor, Dr. Vance, he got up and just explained what cybersecurity was and what you could do with it. And at the end of his lecture, I went up and said, hey, this is what I want to do for my career. So from there, I made it happen. So it was kind of a, a snap decision partway through. Um, and then I had the good fortune to get an internship working at SOC, and I was able to just kind of build from there and wind up where I am now. And the rest was history? Pretty much, pretty much, with <laughs> a lot of work on, on the side. Oscar Pineda, United Airlines. Um, actually, no. Um, I, it, wh wh when I was in college, I thought cybersecurity was all either reverse engineering or a whole lot of policy uh, that at the time was boring. You know, I wanted to be a programmer. <laughs> Um, so uh, several years ago, I, I uh, got the opportunity to join a security team as a software engineer uh, doing in-house uh, development for, for the security team itself. Um, eventually, I just like started uh, joining more security meetings as a as an, uh, subject matter expert <clears throat> coming from the uh, software side with some of the uh, folks in compliance and uh, other, other engineers, security engineers. Uh, on the team and, and uh, enterprise wide. And uh, after a couple of years of doing that, I, I just got more interested and I got an opportunity to join as a um, AppSec analyst and, and AppSec vulnerability management analyst. So I did that for a little while and uh, here I am today. Marcin Kopech, Cisco. Oh, you know, like everything started around uh, 2000. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the internet boom age. Uh, in that time in Poland, um, the fixed internet connection was pretty expensive. So people uh, have started building their own uh, local networks um, to connect each other and set up uh, first uh, Linux servers with NAT to shared uh, internet connection. So that's uh, wh uh, when I started, yeah, so with my own network and first Linux server. And as you may guess, if you have your network and your server, you need to have it protected because otherwise mm -hmm. your neighbor will hack into that server. And <laughs> I remember people from that times which were uh, really clever, uh, read something on uh, IRC channels uh, start, you know, playing with, uh, yeah. So that's why I've, I've learned uh, cybersecurity. But my um, first job was in, um, uh, let's say, foundation. <laughs> I can't remember. Founded, for, for, it, it was like a um, nonprofit organization. Uh, okay which delivered uh, trainings to external people and uh, did some consulting staff for small business enterprises. So that is where I had a first opportunity to share my cyber security knowledge to the outside world. Uh, then I've joined a bank and, and worked for a couple of years for banking and financial organizations then 10 years for T-Mobile, for telecommunication industry, and then I landed at Cisco. Got so snagged at Cisco, yes. Yeah, how my career uh, looks like. So 20 years in industry already. And your role today is a security engineering, engineering tech lead at Cisco? Uh, yes, yes. So I'm currently working as a cyber 
like security engineering tech lead uh, at Cisco. Uh, my area ex of expertise is uh, offensive security, ethical hacking and threat hunting. And my main role is to uh, protect our uh, Cisco U, <laughs> our learning uh, platform. Yes, protect the young and aspiring minds of <laughs> Raja Soundaramurti, Cisco. So, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Marcin. And same question to you, Raja. Uh, what is your cybersecurity story and was it something you were always interested in? Sure. Before that, uh, um, what you see cybersecurity in movies is very different from what you do in an in industry, right? Yeah, sure. So, I'll start with that. So I was a developer or leading large uh, uh, development teams in uh, building cloud native applications. In 2015 or 2016, my product uh, got end of life. I was trying to f figure out where do I pivot? Should I pick up data? Data was like a huge thing. Everyone was doing data and there was sure. something on cybersecurity, not a very glamorous thing. Uh, I used to do cybersecurity as part of a development teams just to do it towards the end. And always when something else happens, it was more reactive. Then on, um, I think it was, it was a day where I was trying to just book up a certification on cybersecurity because I was trying to figure out and I did the same time the data also. And I finished both the certifications and my uh, leader at the time just sent out to the group, how, oh, by the way, he has finished this. I think that was like a basic entry level certification. So that motivated me, then I took the next level and I took the next levels. I think in a month I finished all of those certifications. Then he asked me what you could do uh, after you finish this. Then I was seeing as a developer, what I hate the most is uh, doing security towards the end rather than how do we bake in into the day-to-day -day stuff. The problem is in cybersecurity, it's a very fragmented market. Uh, in any enterprise, at least there will be 15 to 22 tools they will be using. Uh, in Cisco, we use from there between 18 tools. Oh, so man. the biggest challenge for a developer is to go through each one of these tool, configure it, get the results, where it was very unproductive time for that. So I, I started looking at that and see how we can automate it, make it easy for the developer. That's how my cybersecurity journey started. So think of it like a developer trying to ease his life and for others to make <laughs> cybersecurity. That's how... I started leading cybersecurity within the learning and certification organization. And um, and today we have a fully automated system where Marcin is part of it. So uh, the developers spend more time in uh, um, doing a shift lab security rather than to doing towards the end. And how do we make it simplified? So I've been doing it for the last seven, eight years and it's always been a learning experience, right? So he, this is one industry where you need to learn every day um, so, uh, but sometimes sure. it will be a little bit boring because it will look like a lot of documentations and things like that. So uh -huh. we need to really figure out how to do it with a lean model because uh, mostly it will come across to be documentation heavy than engineering heavy, but we can do it the other way also. No, absolutely. And you're also in the position of hiring people, right? You're a hiring manager today. Yeah. Did you hire Marson? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to ask some hard-hitting questions about why you hired Marcin. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the hiring manager experience and specifically what types of roles you're hiring for and are these like entry-level, intermediate, experienced? Uh, it, it depends. Uh, for example, you are setting up the team new and uh, you will look for a combination of entry and experience if you have a well-established products where you want people with the expertise, like Marcin is one of those person who has got deep expertise in security. Um, so when, when you look for it, you, you need to see on what position your product is, in which stage in, uh, in its evolution. In the first one or two years, you need to have a mix of the talent, both uh, uh, experience and the entry level. As it gets progressed, you may need to have, uh, um, if you have more experienced people, then you have to have uh, the combination of the entry level people as well. Uh, but so it's, it's very tough to say whether you look for entry or experience it depends on the type of the product you work with. And what could you like throw out just some of the titles that you're hiring for or that you've hired for in the past? 
Yeah, so uh, security itself, uh, there is not any fixed titles in security because uh, you will see mostly uh, security analyst, yeah, or yeah. you will see, uh, or you will see uh, uh, offensive security, or uh, you will see a red team, things like that. So in my mind, I look at security as two major things. One is offensive security and defensive security. So, but the title may not have that, but in in the defensive security, is mostly where the security analyst fits in, where they try to run the scans, figure out what vulnerabilities are there, try to stop things before it hits the production. Then there is the next part of it, which is the red team or penetration tester or the offensive security or threat hunter, all, all of these titles are common in the market, where after it hits the production, even before a malicious person finds something uh, big in your system, how can our own team find that? So that's where Martin plays a role. He is more is is on the offensive security side. Nice, Marson MVP here. So some of our interviewees have already spoken to the backgrounds that they came from and whether or not those helped them, particularly in IT or network engineering. And I wanted to dive a little deeper into that with a few of the interviewees. Oscar Pineda, Principal Application Security Architect at United Airlines. And I'm I'm interested in the fact that you transitioned from software engineering to cyber. Do you think that the software engineering background served you well in that transition or was it did it feel like a jump? Oh no, it, it was it, it helped me a lot in that transition. Uh you know, having especially going towards more of the uh, vulnerability management and appsec type of uh I guess tasks. Uh it having that technical knowledge of how development teams work, you know, understanding the culture, you know, the pressures that they have to be on, their obligations, uh, knowing that and how the development process works, especially the CICD pipeline, right? Um, at the time, shift left was, uh, it wasn't new, but it was still something that was a little bit aspirational, I believe. Uh-huh. So under, e- even just having the knowledge of understanding a uh, development pipeline, you know, the software development life cycle helped greatly. Yeah. And I saw too, that one of your roles, again, you've, you've had a, a cool career here. Um, one of your roles was security DevOps. And um, I, I, could you just explain a little bit of what that entailed and was it any different than a typical DevOps role? Uh, yes, because, uh, you know, that is focused on, it, it's kind of a cultural collaboration with a platform team. Uh, at least in in that particular role, right? So so the uh, w- usually a platform team is not thinking maybe specifically of some of the needs for security. You know, they're not always they are of course you know being professionals they do think about it. But um, I was coming in with the viewpoint as well. I have uh, I have needs from the compliance folks, privacy folks, you know, general security controls. Um, so having that. I guess, mindset and perspective coming my way throughout the DevOps process that makes it diff- a little bit more different from uh, DevOps. I kind of believe that for the most part, uh, a regular DevOps person can, of course, go into set DevOps pretty well. Um, I wouldn't claim to be like the master guru <laughs> for all things uh, security, especially set DevOps. Uh, it, it's, but I, I think in total, it's more of a cultural shift. So, so you have... You have a traditional platform person or maybe an SRE coming into some type of DevOps pipeline role. You have someone from security thinking, and we, we meet in the middle. Sure. Yeah, and I think that there's definitely a need for more people who are in that intersection, have some expertise on both sides of the, the fence is my perspective on it. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like to think about it is we have the same goal, maybe different masters, right? Like I have interest from my bosses and they're thinking from the security mindset and we have our responsibilities there. Whereas maybe someone from a DevOps role, they're thinking, you know, hey, I'm just trying to push to production as safely as I can. And, exactly. And yeah. being able to work together and being able to respect each other's expertise and goals. That is probably the most important thing, you know, matching the personalities and being able to work together instead of having your silos and and information hiding. Taylor Myers Lambert, Information Security Analyst at TSC Security. Um, So with this background in software engineering, do you feel like that helped you in your cybersecurity career moving forward? Or was it like a big leap um, in just like culture or skills? 
Absolutely. Um, I do think that while there are uh, probably like opportunities in cybersecurity for someone with no IT background, I think that bringing that already can kind of like help you as far as like navigating like which roles or areas of cybersecurity will be like better suited for you. Yep. Um, Cause I always tell people like definitely emphasize your transferable skills. Right. And for me, it was coding. So that's why I think application security was like, um, the best area that I could apply to. And that's probably why I was able to get the role at SEMGRAT is because like, I knew how to like read code. Now it's just about focusing on like finding vulnerabilities in that code. Right. And then at this new role, um, in GRC, it's definitely helped me like make an impact on the team already. Cause, uh, I was just offered to give like a secure coding presentation to one of the engineering teams for one of our clients. And they, you know, like my boss, he could tell that I had a passion and an interest and some experience with applications like security and stuff. So that really helps him with like, okay, like these like the different kind of projects and uh, needs that we have that we currently can't fill. Like, how about, you know, Taylor, are you interested in that? And so now it's helped me get like more um projects and everything so yeah uh i do think having like that background in development really helps for sure adam kilgore technical marketing engineer technical leader for secure firewall at cisco you also mentioned too starting out your career with a couple internships one of them being network engineering um how crucial do you feel like those internships were to your overall career trajectory uh at least at the time and i think it's still true today um security is kind of a uh it's a catch-22 I um, you have to have experience to get into security, but you have to get into security to get experience. Sure. So, yeah, the, the internships really uh, paved the way. Um, I was able to get a job, um, a tech job with Cisco doing technical support um, that I may have been able to get without the internships. I don't know. I, I mean, it, it's an unknown. I don't know how much my internships played a role in that hiring decision. But it, you have to get a start somewhere. So the internships were very important, especially in college. I mean, You've got a degree, but you don't have the hard skills. So you yeah. can meet that internship opportunity. So I've always been very grateful for that initial SOC opportunity. And once again, it's something I've been able to use throughout my career. So I, I think it was very vital. Um, maybe I would have found my way in another way, but it definitely helped a lot. Raja Soundaramorti, Cisco. Um, are there backgrounds uh, that you believe as a hiring manager prepare you for a career in cybersecurity? Um, or could you just jump right in? Sure. Um, of course, you uh, in the cybersecurity, you, if you are on the networking side, because we are from Cisco, uh, then uh, you could be a networking engineer, or you can be a network uh, operations engineer, so, or you can be an application engineer where you are building applications. So I'll talk about networking. If you're on the networking, what Marcin mentioned, know about the basics of networking, all the OSI layers and things like that, and most importantly, the cyber ops add on top to it. So foundations of networking, networking components, and the, how do you do cyber ops? If you're on the application side, then most importantly, try to learn about cloud. It could be any cloud, uh, AWS, yep. Azure, or uh, GCP, anyone is fine. And then uh, try to also learn about uh, cloud native application development, which is mostly microservices. Then you try to understand how vulnerability scanning everything works, and uh, most importantly, how do you build uh, or create a secure application? There is OWASP top ten vulnerabilities, and how do you write code to avoid it? So learn, learn those basic foundational stuffs, and uh, these are not very complicated. It's just that you need to really spend time to learn them. Sure, and you have to practice them. No, I love that you actually lay out a sequential path um, because I think that's something a lot of people are looking for and they get overwhelmed by the number of things to learn. And yeah, and there's a lot important. of things because uh, <clears throat> we spend a lot of time in learning many things because it changes. Uh, so time and again, I go back to uh, OWASP top 10 to refresh. For example, we are currently working on AI and uh, how do we secure AI applications? So myself and Marcin, we went back to the OWASP. There is top 10 OWASP, uh, um, large language model vulnerabilities to be avoided for. So it's always good to refer back and connect like that. And then with the AI, I think cybersecurity will be one of the important thing because mm -hmm. not everyone uh, is thinking of cybersecurity at this point in time, but, but I think it will mostly be important. The DevNet community is also really interested in what kind of degrees or certifications are required to break into cyber. 
Raja, from the hiring manager's perspective, how important are certifications to you? Sure. Um, see, if you are early in career and you get uh, a lot of resumes to figure out who is the right resume to take it to the next level, the certification plays an important role for the selection. Right? You see, because you see someone is certified and that too recently, uh, when you do certifications, don't put certifications which you did five years back. Sometimes it's it's all about the recency because it shows that you have a good understanding about the topic, um, and then it's for the initial selection. Uh, that's how I selected Marsin because we we got like hundreds of resumes, and I saw a few resumes where and Marsin was stand out because I think at that time he did like. 18 or 20 certificates. That's a lot. Yeah. In the last, yeah, in the last two years or three years, right? And and Martin has got the fun of doing certification. He's he he is he, uh, a weirdo in doing the certifications. But uh, but someone who is early in the career and um, your certifications plays an important role. So I would recommend people to pick an area of your passion, what you like, and do the certification. And your goal should not be just to get certified, but to learn it. And yes. the certification also teaches you to learn things uh, in a methodical in a little bit longer duration of time. You have to do deep learning when you get certified. Uh, with today's micro learning, where in 15 minutes you can learn multiple topics, uh, it's, it's, it's good to know things at the breadth level, uh, but you have to also know depth level. When you start working in security at an enterprise scale, depth mm -hmm. is more important. Breadth is good but it's not sufficient to do your day-to-day -day job. That's where certification plays that role of going, making you to go to that depth of investigation, trying to analyze and also try to see how whatever concepts you read, you can apply it. Now, one more thing, if I may. Yes. So once you finish the certification, it ensures that you practice it. Figure out a job that connects well and start practicing it. Otherwise, you'll forget, right? Um, so it's very important. It's not just doing the certification, but also you try to apply it in your job. If you are, if you are trying to get a job, try to apply those concepts on a regular basis. No, those are both fantastic tips. Getting so getting some of that deep expertise and actually applying what you've learned. Uh, that's solid advice. Oscar Pineda, Principal Application Security Architect at United Airlines. You know, one of the questions I get asked a lot too is, okay, what hard skills or especially certifications do I need to get into this? And your background is interesting because um, I think I saw on your LinkedIn, you have the CompTIA Security Plus certification, um, but you're not um, swimming in certification. So what was it that enabled you to move between these roles? Was there something else on your side um, besides certifications? Oh, most definitely technical aptitude with software engineering again, right? Uh, so so as a new person coming in, I, I, I don't think certifications alone will get you there in general, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are outstanding cases, there are exceptional individuals, and then you get lucky. <laughs> um, my particular route, I think, I think on this software engineering alone, plus all the security I learned along the way. And, and now I know more of that than software engineering. I think combining those two things, you know, definitely got me the, the technical aptitude is what got me there as far as understanding the security needs for, uh, for software. And maybe being able to like communicate that communicate things that you've built or your understanding of systems, or I don't know, is that kind of along the lines of what you're thinking? Oh, oh, completely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for catching that. Because uh, as a software engineer, the communication part of it was was pretty minimal on my part, right? Like I spoke to my team, I spoke to maybe a scrum master or two project manager, you know, a manager sometimes. In my security roles, it's completely the opposite. You know, I'm communicating all the way up to a board of directors if necessary. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, everyone's everyone has a, a lot of concern about security, especially these days. So, yeah, the, that that is something I had to learn along the way. Um, and I'm thankful. And that's why I think it's very important to have a diverse uh, skill set and diverse people coming in from from pretty much all fields. You still want to have the technical aptitude. You know, that's a no brainer. But it's it's not something that has to be, you know, you don't have to be, you know, Linus Torvalds, for example, yeah. you know, 
uh, so so it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to come from something else. Just just realize, you know, there's some kind of baseline that you'll have to know. You'll have to be a good communicator. You know, um, have that part of it. And I, I think you're all set. You know, there there are many different routes to get to the same place. Greg Bales, regional systems engineer at Fortinet. Going back on that background, right? And you know, you started out with that strong network engineering background, and you've got a degree in it. Um, and I, I know you went on for a master's in cybersecurity. Could you tell me a little bit about what went into that decision, and do you feel like it was worth it? So to be frank, it, partially it was just, hey, I've got the benefit here. They'll pay for it. I oh, feel like I, I need to get that. Uh, so that, that was a big part of it. Uh, but there was also the understanding that, in my opinion, degrees help open doors. They may not in of themselves mean much. You know, 10 years down the road, IT is going to look completely different than when I got you know, my degree. I remember early in my career talking to a seasoned field engineer saying, yeah, you know, I got my degree in IT in the 80s. Uh, how, how relevant is that today? It, it isn't. But does it right. still open doors for me in jobs and get me opportunities? Yes, it does. Because I think degrees are something that everybody can understand at a certain level and HR can understand that. So being able to check that box simply to have the conversation with a company um, really helped a lot. Um, once I get into actually talking to the IT teams, they usually don't care. Uh, that, that's when things like certifications and experience come into play. Um, certifications can help get you know that more specific point in time in a certain product set understanding there. Sometimes it's a little more generic if it's something like CompTIA, um, but you know if you're talking about a specific vendor getting a certification in that and you know, within the past couple of years usually means hey I do actually have a certain level of knowledge, um, but really it's going to come down to hey let's have a technical conversation. And I'm probably going to be able to weed out whether or not you just know the answer to a basic question or if you've actually had to go deal with the quirks of how things work in the real world. Sure. No, that's that's highly important. I think we we talk about that a lot, especially people who are first breaking in that that difference between I was able to ace the exam versus I can actually apply what I learned. Oh. And, and I want to see if you have a suggestion to uh, you in terms of applying knowledge and not just memorizing a test answer bank for certifications. I frequently have people ask me, well, you know, I've earned these certifications, but how am I supposed to practice these things if I don't have a role? So yeah. is there anything that you did early on or you've heard people do that was really effective to practice some cybersecurity skills or even just networking skills, foundational skills? Uh, yeah, I mean, military, again, helped a lot because you just <laughs> kind of have some a lot of old gear sitting around. And, you know, maybe sometimes we didn't always treat production as we should treat production. And <laughs> didn't so much have the lab environment that we should have. Uh -huh. uh, so that, that was, again, learning through the fire really great. Uh, you know, hey, I had a, an experience early on in my career where I didn't understand routing entirely at that point. And somebody said, hey, I need this IP space over here. And so I went and added it and I broke an entire base uh, servers for 20 minutes for everybody. Uh, and I was like, oh, that couldn't possibly be me. I was working over on this device and that device is the one that's broken. Can't be me. And so getting that experience very early on to say, oh, nope, I broke something. Uh, but I mean, to your question on, I don't have that potential, potentially. I'm trying to get into the field. Um, I think that is where, for cybersecurity, being able to roll it back to getting any kind of job in IT and mm -hmm. building a foundation somewhere and getting experience there, it can always transfer over. Um, and it just comes down to, hey, what are you learning about security when you're learning about this? When it was you know switching, and stuff we're talking about, hey, am I using SNMP v2? Am I using SNMP v3? And what are the security implications on whether or not that's encrypted? Uh, and what could happen if that wasn't there? Looking at different you know, standardizations for compliance. Um, I think, you know, a more actionable thing was always getting my own home lab gear, just getting a cheap, you know, I've, I've got a switch that's under $100 sitting in my basement. That is strictly an old Cisco switch that I used when I first joined the military uh, because I know it's still like the back of my hand uh, after so many years of using them that I was like, yep, I know this device. So anytime I ever just need to do something with a third party switch, 
I'm probably just going to use this switch because it's what I know really easily. Mm -hmm. Um, But there is a lot of, you know, older stuff that's even, you know, 10 years old that still works perfectly fine out there. Um, And then labbing out what you can. Um, Now, does that immediately relate to current technology? Maybe not, but it does help it reinforce those basics and whatnot. So I think getting curious about, hey, I'm learning about something in a certification. Can I do that in my lab gear? Whether that's virtualized or physical hardware, Mm -hmm. um, can I do something similar to that? You know, understand why you can or cannot do that and what the limitations on that might be. I completely agree with you. And it's partially that confidence too, right? Hey, I have configured a device before. I have re-imaged a device or whatever it is that you're wanting to do, right? You you have done it somewhere at some point. Exactly. Yep. Adam Kilgore, technical marketing engineer, technical leader for Secure Firewall at Cisco. Going back to those earlier years, um, I know you got the bachelor's in uh, information. Was it information security or information systems? Uh, information systems. I, information I have a full system. master's degree. Yeah. Yes, that's what I wanted to ask you about. What prompted you to go for the master's? Um, that one, it was actually a pretty easy call. So I went to Brigham Young University and they had a integrated master's program where you could do it in five years. Oh, so wow. I was like, hey, five years for the bigger degree. So Dang, so you, you had the vision from the beginning, you know, yeah. getting them both, killing two birds with one stone. Yep. Yeah, it's, um, I, I would say it depends on the degree, whether it's worth it. Um, there's a lot of hard skills that can benefit you in security. If you can learn Linux, Windows, programming, um, networking, any of those, if you have the opportunity to get more experience in a higher learning environment, it's definitely something that can serve you well through a, a, a security career. Absolutely. And do you feel like uh, if you could go back today that you would do that two-in-one uh, master's program? Has that served you well, or or is that more of a future um, path that you, you see your career going toward? Uh, it was definitely worth it for me. Um, I was able, just because I had the master's degree, I got a little bit of a better starting salary than I would have otherwise. I definitely learned ah. some good things in that uh, last year. But also, like I said, I'm information systems, more of a general degree. And I ended up just kind of specialized pretty hard on networking and network security. So if I had to do over again, I would probably go IT and get more of those networking hard skills up front. But eh, I didn't know okay. where I was coming at the time. So Jose Caro, Information Security Analyst for City of Iowa. Okay, so you had a uh, guardian angel um, guidance counselor who convinced you to uh, take some IT courses. Um, and then you ended up getting your bachelor's, right, in... Information system security. Um, so could you tell us like how, I think you said you, your profile says you started with an associates and then you went on to that bachelor. So what prompted you to major in information security specifically? Um, I, I think it was just kind of like the general path of, you know, of growth, how it goes. My associates was uh, for networking administration and like a small focus in cybersecurity. But generally that whole, The whole program was kind of meant to just introduce you to the world of IT and give you a little taste of everything. So I touched, you know, servers, uh, networking, security, you know, some development, some Python that I'm not super great at. (laughs) You're, you're, uh, I have no words today, but the thing you hate. Uh Yeah. So many of the interviews that I conducted for this episode brought up needing to hone communication skills. And so I took a second to pick Oscar Pineda's brain on this. Since you mentioned communication too, uh, is there anything in particular that you did to hone your communication skills after being in software engineering, or is it one of those trial by oh. fire situations where being in it and doing it helped? Uh, it, it has evolved, right? So just like a lot of things that you don't know, it's a bit of trial by fire, yeah. and then there's that frustration. And so then I start reaching out. You know, I, I have mentors, I have colleagues that I talk to. You know, you work with one of my colleagues. He's the one that sent me that post uh, originally on LinkedIn. Oh, cool. You know, I learn from everyone. You know, there's there's plenty of books on that on how to communicate you know karen eber how to tell your story has a great one that helped me that helped me in general but it also helped me with job interviews you know being able to make that narrative and come and tell people and being able to condense it in such a way where you're not babbling constantly in meetings or in emails helps a a lot sure yeah no thanks for the book rec too uh, that's always appreciated uh, right on 
I then asked each interviewee to give me a glimpse into the day of a life of either a past job they'd had or a current job they'd had or to explain the current field that they're in of cybersecurity. Starting with Adam Kilgore from Cisco. Um, I know that you have a lot of experience working in security operations centers or SOCs. Could you tell our viewers what a SOC is and just what a day in the life of a SOC might look like? Um, yeah, I can give some backstory on that. So that, that was another experience I was able to get in college. Um, I was able to get, and my first internship was more on the networking side, and I was able to kind of parlay that into a SOC role. So Security Operations Center, I think, is a very good place to start a security career, or at least have some experience there um, to build off of for other roles. Um, you're kind of, it's kind of front and center. You're, you're in the trenches a little bit. So you're monitoring logs and analytics and security tools for an organization looking for active attacks and then raising um, a, a flag or a, a alert or a ticket for your team that um, gets other resources involved in tracking it down. So there, there's high stakes on it. Um, if the SOC misses an attack, then it's quite likely the rest of the organization as a whole will. So there's a lot of pressure on it to, if you see something to actually get that analysis right, identify those true positives in there. Um, the SOC I worked at, um, they had a, we did it in 12 hour shifts, 24 seven. Oh so man. If you're the new guy, you get the uh, night shift, the uh, midnight to noon. So of course, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's quite a bit to bite off, but um, really good experience. I've used my sock experience in one way or another in all of my roles I've had since then. And I just consider it really good context for the rest of a security career and a good way to just build up and understand what security is and what it means um, at, at a functional level right there at the front. And you're currently working in socks for uh, Black Hat conferences, yep. right? So that's a, that's yeah. where I've learned a lot about uh, socks. To be honest, is talking and watching you and others there. And uh, it's funny that you say you know you you have to cross your t's and dot your eyes when in that role because it seems very all or nothing whenever I visit you guys. You're either all you know sitting in the dark, you know, monitoring and you know, uh, you know, joking it up, or it's actively, hey, we need to track this down and take action. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a role where you have to be able to focus and engage quickly. Um, so there's there's a lot of routineness to it, um, and it ca can be hard to stay focused. So once again, if it's like an eight-hour shift, a 12-hour shift, what have you, then you have to be zoned in, but you also have a lot of tasks that are repetitive. Like you might be looking at the same log set day after day for the entirety of that role. And it, you, can, it's a, you have to fight complacency in it. Um, you always have to be considering that there might be a new attack, a new wrinkle you haven't seen before, so you can't just dismiss information. But at the same time, you have to go through a large volume of information in a short amount of time. So there's a tension there. Um, but it's if you're able to stay focused, focus on learning, um, building up your skill set, looking for those new attacks, then it's it's very engaging work. There's a yeah, yeah. really good learning curve on it. Um, but once you, once you hit that ramp, then you'll learn quick, and it's a great experience to have. But yeah, right. it's uh, just just going back to some of your comments. I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you'll find something, and it's one of the more interesting things that you've seen in the day or the week. And all hands on deck, and let's figure it out and solve it. Uh, yeah, I've, I've I feel like I've uh, witnessed experiences on both ends of the extremes where it was constantly busy. Something's you know either not working, or there's an attack, or whatever. And then others where it was uneventful, which can be good. Like you said, you use that time wisely to skill up learn new tooling. Yeah, yeah it, it's a balance because on one, one end, if, if nothing happens, then that's great. I mean, our security tools are doing the job. We're not under attack. Everything's great. But the I, I guess the war stories are when something goes wrong and you actually find, see an attack that you haven't seen before. Yeah. And it's it, it makes you feel alive, but it's also stressful too. <laughs> like you, you've got that tension to catch it. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the work that you currently do? Because I think that the technical marketing engineer role can be misunderstood and specifically what you've been doing recently with Forrester. Um, yeah, so it's um, technical marketing engineers. It's, it's kind of a, a pretty fluid role. Um, you just do what's asked of you and you support <laughs> the product in any way that's needed. So so humble. <laughs> yeah, just just got <laughs> just to jump in there and do whatever they tell you, essentially. <laughs> so um, yeah, but um yeah, it, it's a role that requires a lot of familiarity with a product line or um, a, a system of technology, like, for example, in my case, firewalls. So you got to know the different products you're supporting. Um, you got to know how to market them, obviously, but then also how they work and how they compare to the competition. Um, the project we did with Forrester recently uh, was for the Forrester Wave. 
So um, Forrester will do an assessment of all the different um, firewall platforms. Um, so for example, us being in Cisco, our big competition we're looking at is um, Palo Alto and, and uh, Fortinet. But there's, I think there was over eight um, firewalls evaluated. And for us, it was a big deal because in the Forrester wave in 2022, um, we didn't make the leader quadrant. So we oh, yeah. Back in there. So uh, we had to do um, both a questionnaire um, that was quite lengthy, um, a big written questionnaire, which was mainly where I was focused. And then we also did a live demo of the product. Um, and Forrester, they're, they're not just looking at the... Um, uh, firewalls, we traditionally think about it. They're also looking ahead, like how does this need to evolve? What's next? And how do mm. our, how do the different vendors stack up against those upcoming needs as well? So a lot of uh, cutting edge questions, a lot of cut, um, cutting edge uh, demos, and we were able to put together a, a good presentation and get back in the uh, leader quadrant. So good success for our team, but that's an example of what's asked for in the TME role. Yeah, someone so, evaluating so you need platform, expertise so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, you need expertise in the product and then also, I guess, the ability, the communication skills to both be able to explain and demo that product and also kind of tell the story behind it of where you've been and where it's going is kind of what I'm hearing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I prefer to lean on the technical side. That's where I like to be, but you have to yeah. be able to do a little of the marketing. So for me, I've got a, a decent amount of experience in writing. Um, I minored in English in college, so I kind yeah. of leverage that and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, if something needs to be written, I'll, I can try and help out. Greg Bales, Regional Systems Engineer at Fortinet. You take us through a day in the life of a Regional Systems Engineer. Sure. What does a day look like for you? I, uh, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> uh, so a day in the life, uh, I, I think first off, um, that's my official title. I think more people would probably um, understand the title of a pre-sales engineer yeah. um, is probably what people would understand more. So my job is talking to clients every day um, and saying, hey, you're looking at a new solution and I'm here to help you understand the technological side of things. Um, I have a sales partner who's going to go through, handle, you know, hey, here's who we are as a company. Here's all the, you know, the money stuff and a lot more of the people uh, relationships. Uh, but when it comes down to, all right, you've told me that this stuff all works this way. Um, now, now, you know, I got questions. Uh, that's usually when I'm coming in. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll do things as early as just having a conversation and listening in the background uh, to, hey, here's the issues we're seeing with our current infrastructure. And then popping in to say, hey, here's a, a good technology fit for you. And here's, you know, I think there's also a lot of discovery as far as you know, taking my own experience, um, not just from the military, but also uh, in previous roles, just working as a client, as internal networking and cybersecurity and saying, hey, are you also dealing with these kinds of issues? Because I dealt with them um, or I hear them from other clients. And if you are having those issues, what does that potentially mean? Uh, how can we help solve for that issue? Um, and I think a big thing for me is, you know, being really honest about what things can and cannot happen. Yeah. I never want to be, you know, selling, you know, people call it paperware or whatever. It's just like there are limitations to technology. It doesn't matter what vendor you're on. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to fully understand those limitations because I don't, I never want to work with the client, you know, bring them through this whole process of, you know, gaining their trust and, and getting them to buy a solution set. And then a week or two later, I'm hearing, Hey, this doesn't work at all. Like what we talked about. Um, so it's always, and I think I, I get people to laugh when I'm just like, I don't know that, but I'll figure it out. Uh, which is always, you know, that's my go-to line, the military. Uh, that was, that was always the thing for any compliance regulation stuff is, you know, Hey, if you don't know, just be honest and let them know you'll, you'll follow up. But you uh, know, we're always saying that in tech period, I feel like it, there's no other way to survive. It's just not possible. There's too much. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that's, you know, to your point of view, hearing a lot of, you know, imposter syndrome, I think there's a lot of people in IT who know enough to know they don't know enough. Yeah. Um, that's that's effectively what that is and why I think a lot of us feel that way. Um, you know, at Fortinet, we've got over 50 different products. I will never know all of those products. I know, you know, yeah. a bare level on a lot of things and you know, middle level on a lot of things and only deep in a handful of things. Um, and so 
I know enough to know that, yeah, I couldn't, I can't talk in depth or answer questions and be really confident on a lot of different things. Um, so I think that's, that's why a lot of people feel that way. So getting a little comfortable with that and creating a good community that you can rely on is really helpful. Um, whether or not that's internally or externally, um, we got plenty of different chats that we just build up and say, Hey, we want to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to throw in questions about this stuff, or we've got, you know, weekly meetings that are just to talk tech, um, and just say, Hey, what's going on here? Here's an issue I ran into, or here's some you know, funky issue that I'd never seen before and share that knowledge, um, yes. or ask my own questions. So Marcin Kopech, Cisco. Um, could you just tell us what a CISO is and I don't know, like what does that role actually do? What does a day in the life of a CISO look like? Oh, right. Yeah. So, uh, CISO means chief information security officer. So in that role you are, so it is more, let's say like leader leadership or strategic role, uh, where you are responsible for the information security as a whole. So of course you are responsible for that technical part, but you also need to uh, cover that least uh, technical part. So it is some sort of a broader uh, role. Uh, it, it is um, typical in the small uh, businesses uh, that they can't afford for a large security team. <laughs> and often have a single uh, person dedica dedicated to all uh, security work. Yeah, so I had opportunity to uh, work in, those, uh, in, in that role in, in two companies. Yeah, so... And you yeah, feel like was... that was a, a good way to get a well-rounded uh, experience and, and to learn a lot? Or was there a reason that you eventually left that line of work? Um, you know... Uh, it, it was good experience because I also um, could use that opportunity uh, to, for instance, learn soft skills because it, uh, it is more, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, uh, in that role, uh, you, you deal with people more than when you are a pentester <laughs> doing the you know pentester. What's so funny is I've done a few of these interviews now and it cracks me up how many people have mentioned that how they were um, suddenly force fed the need to gain communication skills. They're like, oh yeah, all these things mm -hmm. are interesting to me and I have all these hard skills, but ah, oh, now I have to learn how to communicate. So that's, that's funny. Jose Caro, Information Security Analyst for City of Iowa. So explain to people who might not be familiar what InfoSec is in your own words. So to me, information security or infosec is an overarching genre, right, of a job function. And within that, there are smaller job functions or genres. So, you know, networking is part of that for me. Cybersecurity is a whole different genre as well. Uh, GRC, so governance, risk, and compliance is, a, is another genre. But it encompasses pretty much anything that deals with our information or data and just kind of pulls it together and kind of makes everything just mesh the way it's supposed to. Um, and and uh, because I have the, the developer side of things, could you tell us what's a sample day in your life look like? Are you, yeah, just, just kind of give us a picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty lackluster, honestly. Uh, <laughs> everybody, you know, yeah. says cyber is, you know, hacking this, you know, defending that, stopping this, you know, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty relaxed, I guess, until things actually go sideways. But, uh, you know, start off the day either from home or in the office, depending on, you know, on what that week's like and answer some emails, um, review kind of some changes, I guess, that recently now um, reviewing framework changes and small little updates on, you know, some incident response plans, things like that. And pretty much some more meetings, um, <laughs> given, yeah, given updates and kind of just planning out, you know, next month. It's, it's always trying to, you know, plan for, for the future and not now, I guess. So. Sure. I mean, there's something to be said about roles that are not uh, constantly putting out fires and that are preventative and strategic. I, I do think that there's lots of people who would not like to constantly put out fires.
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, putting out a fire here and there, you know, it, it's it's a fun time. It's great. It's a little thrill, right? But <laughs> yeah, just a little, you know, many, one one fire. Yeah, if, if there's too many fires going on, then you know that's that's a problem. Oscar Pineda, principal application security architect at United Airlines. So, in in your current role, let's talk about that for just a second. Principal application security architect. There's a lot going on in that title. Mm -hmm. Could you break that down a little bit for us and tell us what does a day in the life look like for you? Uh, a day in the life usually, uh, so so we're responsible for for a secure uh, development life cycle generally, right? That that's a push in a lot of companies. So uh, in in my in my current role, I'm responsible for that primarily. That's my focus. Uh, secondary to that is I answer all things security for whatever uh, set of products I may have, whatever teams. So the the mindset is that I am a security person embedded with several teams at once. I think that's the difference between maybe a an AppSec engineer in a particular role doing scans and architect has a wider view. Um, it's a less technical role day to day. Um, technical app uh, expertise, of course, definitely helps. Sure. But a lot of it is that collaboration. It's making sure that um, people are accountable, including yourself. It's making sure that you communicate up and down, left and right, all around, everywhere. It's um, having insight on uh, security posture, new things. There's AI. So sure. it's a very well-rounded role. And it, it's typically, I, I, I believe that it's the same in most companies, you know, that type of person. Mm-hmm. And are you enjoying being, um, having your foot a little more in both sides of, you know, being around people and communicating and also still being technical and needing that technical expertise? Or do you ever wish like, man, like I wish I was back in the IDE? Like, uh, it, it comes and goes, right? Like, because when you're, when you're so down in the weeds, you know, you're the metaphorical, you know, person in the basement not seeing anyone, well, there's the frustrations because you don't have any kind of strategic uh, vision or agency sometimes. You're unable to you're unable to give input because no one knows who you are, right? Sure. Uh, if, if you get too far in the other direction, right, then you lose that technical aptitude. You, you, you don't understand the, the, the engineers that you have to communicate with. Um, so it's a challenge. It's a challenge getting into both worlds. I like it a lot myself um i think i think the most challenge is just you know, trying to spin all the plates at once just like mo many other jobs though taylor myers lambert tsc security can you just briefly explain what application security might entail or the kinds of things you need to know yeah um for sure so application security it ranges a lot of different like areas but uh for the most part it's being able to perform like secure code reviews so yeah um in a typical code review you're reviewing your testing code to ensure that it's like functional and efficient, right? Or efficiently written. But uh, with secure code review, it's like you're actually, uh, you're reviewing the code to see like if there's like any like, missing controls or like something that could be uh, implemented to help secure it. So for instance, uh, let's say like you're testing a web app and you're looking for all the different inputs on that page or on different pages to make sure that there's validation that are like, that is put in place to protect against certain attacks like SQL injections and cross-site scripting. Um, a little bit of pen testing can be involved um, with application security. So like there's such thing as like white box testing and black box testing. So the secure code reviews will fall under white box testing. That's where you're giving access to the source code and you can like just like look at it. And uh, it's one of the best ways to like help prevent against like attacks and stuff. But then there's black box, which is like really like you're acting as like the attacker kind of in a way because you're not given access to the source code because yep. in a typical scenario we aren't. We're just given like a web app or a mobile app and uh, we're given, you know, we're looking at it from the eyes of just like any customer or anyone who's browsing that web in that website, but we have malicious thinking. <laughs> Um, so we're thinking of like, oh, okay, like, let me mess with this input. Like, let me try like this attack or like, let me like look for information disclosure, which means uh, looking for any like data that may be like leaked or something in the comments or something like that. Um, application security uh, is, yeah, it's mainly around that. And then also helping with like integrating different tools into um, mm -hmm. the pipeline to help ensure that there's a secure software development lifecycle. So, um, that basically means like, all right, so in the 
I hope I'm not going on too long. <laughs> no, it's perfect. I mean, this is this is what a podcast is. So. <laughs> okay, cool. So like in the software development life cycle, uh, I won't go e- go through like every phase, but I'll go through some. Like it usually starts with like design phase, maybe. So um, there could be so in the design phase, you're this is before you code out um, the application and everything or a feature, and uh, you just have like the design of it. Like you have like what fun- like functionality you want to have. And an application security engineer could be doing something uh, in that phase called threat modeling. So threat modeling is where you're analyzing that application and you're identifying like all the different ways that all the different things that can go, that can go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like recommend you like okay, like you're missing this kind of you're missing this security control that would help protect this application or this feature or feature against some type of attack or vulnerability. This is what I recommend that you put in place. And so you're kind of acting as like the software engineer's like security focused best friend. That's really what application security engineers like do and what they should be doing. Yeah, um, which we were kind of talking about before recording too, how that's very needed, how there's <laughs> gaps in tooling and time and education on, on how to do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, that's what I'm hoping to do in this role, especially because like um, we're working with like a lot of startups that are in different levels of maturity. And so some of these teams, like, they may not have a CICD pipeline in place or they may not have different tools like SAS and DAS tools or not even know um, what these tools, like, these security tools are and why it's important and how do we use this. And then how do we interpret the scans from those results in order to, like, prioritize, like, the vulnerabilities that we need to prioritize. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that seems like it'd be rewarding, too. You get to meet people where they are. And, I mean, for some people, be their introduction to application security it sounds like and honestly like i get to learn too because um there's a lot of different tools that i'm going to be introduced to to help them uh like work with and everything that i hadn't um worked with before so that'll it'll be very mutually beneficial i feel like so um like the crux of my role as a grc analyst is making sure well okay first off we'll uh, be like writing security policies for an organization or updating it to reflect like the current processes that are happening in the organization. And um, there are certain controls or tests that are needed in order to fulfill those different policies in order to meet compliance. So for instance, because I know that was probably like, what? <laughs> for some- <laughs> You're pretty good at breaking it down. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, hey, I'm learning as I go, you know? <laughs> Um, one of the things that may be needed um, to fulfill like SOC 2 compliance or whatever kind of compliance is a CICD pipeline in place. Now, as a GRC analyst, I'm not building that CICD pipeline. I'm more so, I'm more so like ensuring that it is built and that there is proof. So I'm gathering like, so I will be like the one talking to the engineering team. Okay, so do we have a CICD pipeline? Oh, you use Jenkins? Okay, cool. Can you send me, or GitHub Actions, whatever they're using. And I'll be like, okay, can you send me like a screenshot of like your GitHub configuration so I can just see that the CICD pipeline is working. Um, Another thing that could be required is, let's say S3 buckets, right? For those, that's the AWS service that is used to store static files and is hosted up in the cloud. And so I'm like, all right, so you have S3 buckets. Cool, cool beans. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> have version enables. Um, just like making sure that that everything that they are using um, is just securely done. And so that and that we can ha- get like the screenshots or the evidence that we need in order to uh, to gather that all that evidence to uh, send and forward to the auditor who will be performing the audit. And so uh, that's, so that's, it's definitely like, more of a client facing role, which is something that I haven't done too much in my career. Um, I have as a software developer, but it's very different. It's very, very different. Um, oh yeah, just, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, and you're in way, way more meetings. Um, and it's, it's, it's cool though. And there are some other things that I'll be doing in the role that, um, other GRC analysts may do, which is vulnerability scanning or different kinds of testing and stuff. So as you know, just to make sure that, uh, everything is accurate and up to date um for these auditors so they can review it and just make it easier for them so yeah Yeah. no i mean i (laughs) it's funny i had all these questions here but i'm like she already like knows the drill can tell the story break down the role like i don't even (laughs) hardly like to ask anything so a few of the people i interviewed are really active online and on social media for educational reasons or for representation and i'm going to link to all of their 
uh, handles and presents in the description below. Uh, but I did ask Jose a little bit about his experience on TikTok. Well, and speaking of, right, we met on TikTok and I know you're doing like a cybersecurity awareness month series. Um, what what uh, prompted you to be on TikTok and what are you hoping to teach people about cybersecurity? So what prompted me to be on TikTok initially was, I guess, me reflecting on how I got to where I was at and kind of saying like, hey, no one really told me that, you know, IT or, you know, cybersecurity or networking uh, was a was a career option for me, um, and it was mainly just to bring attention to, like the four percent of like Hispanics or Latinos in cybersecurity, and kind of that's what prompted me to to do this, right? If some you know sixteen seventeen year old uh, you know Hispanic kid can relate to seeing me, like hey, well I'm in the same boat, like didn't know that was an option, but now knows it's an option, and they give it a shot and they fall in love with it. Uh, then, you know, my goal is complete for, for that section of things. But if you can progressively, you know, push that out, reach, you know, different audiences, um, not just, you know, Hispanic or Latinos, pretty much just anybody. Um, and, you know, change the ch change their life a little bit, if not, or give them a different perspective on, you know, what they think they're capable of, then, you know, any little win is, is a big win in my book, you know. And finally, we wrapped up with some takeaways and advice. Yeah. Um, last question to both of you, and I'll start with Raja. Um, in your opinion, is this a good time for folks to try to break into cybersecurity? Why or why not? And what step would you recommend taking first? Sure. I think it's the best time to learn about cybersecurity, and they'll tell why. And I believe in, and I, that's why I've been investing. The fact that most of our jobs and with the AI coming in, it's not going to replace, but it can definitely uh people will start using ai for the, the their regular work right so whatever sure. you spend three four days can be done in few hours and that applies to cyber security so most part of the things that we used to read a lot um, and then try to understand which one is the high priority vulnerability can be an analyst and security analyst who spends let's say and five to seven hours can now spend if he has got the right set of tools and the right talent, how to use AI and cybersecurity and the foundational cybersecurity knowledge can be done in 50 minutes. Uh, and by the way, this is an experimentation which we are doing ourselves and the initial results yeah. uh, lead that way. So I, I think it's very important for people if, if they are really like cybersecurity for protecting things, protecting asset is an important thing and it's something they like it and they're passionate about, jump in and start doing it. And what you need to do is uh, uh, you need to have this mindset of uh, protecting things, right? Bro, mm -hmm. in, the, in the digital world, you need to have the mindset of protecting the digital assets. It starts with you. If you use the same password for all of your banking things, be sure that one day one password will get hacked and all your things is yeah. possible to get hacked. So you start with your own personal thing, how you are going to protect yourself. It may look a little paranoid, but cybersecurity people are always paranoid. So be <laughs> positively paranoid that whatever you build, whatever you are secure is going to get uh, compromised and see how you can fix it, right? And I mean, once you start practicing it on your regular life and day to day, and that's all is defensive security is all about. Then you go and learn the defensive security concepts in software. The same thing applies to offensive security, where you try it instead of someone coming and stealing your, from your home by breaking it or something. So back in my home country, we always, after going out, we used to ensure that the door is properly locked. Just push and check, right? So, uh -huh. it, or when you're going in a crowded bus, you used to check whether the wallet is still there. So those are simple things. The same thing applies for the offensive security. If a system is up and running, see where the excessive amount of uh, uh, calls are being made. So for, I, I just gave these analogies, but for you to get started, the best thing is to start with some form of certification be it on the application side, be it on the uh, networking side, because that will give you the foundation. Once you have the foundation ready and you've learned it, apply it in your day-to-day -day job or day-to-day -day work. If you're still a college student, apply to the 
uh, things that you are doing, the way in which you are building the program and things like that. I, I, it's more of a mindset than you can the structurally learn. Structurally, you can get something out of the certification, but you have to start doing it on your day-to-day -day stuff. Sure. So the Raja step-by-step -step program is develop the cybersecurity mindset, um, start working on a certification, and then figure out how to apply that. Awesome. You're very well comprehended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm impressed too with the with the head injury here. Um, and so same question for you, Marcin. We're going to close us out. In your opinion, is this a good time for folks to break into cybersecurity? Why or why not? And what first step would you recommend? All right. Yeah. So. If you are feeling that uh, the cyber sec is interesting for you, then follow your heart and go ahead and start your career uh, in cyber sec. Uh, and how to start? Uh, I would uh, recommend working on basics first because you know uh, security is about breaking things or how the things can be broken. That sounds and, fun. Yeah, and in order uh, to break something, you first need to understand how that thing uh, operates uh, normally in normal circumstances. Sure. So, so for instance, if you want to break into the, let's say, Oracle database, uh, like hack into the Oracle database, you want accomplish that without knowing how this database operates, you know, basic SQL syntax uh, is what you <laughs> need to yeah, yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just to, uh, yeah, so work on that basics. I, I would recommend uh, start learning networking, operating systems, especially Linux, uh, scripting, um, Python is good. Mm -hmm. Start, um, yeah, and that is the bare minimum. <laughs> oh, I, th I, mean, I think that's a very logical statement that you have to know how things work in order to break them and or to protect them. So <laughs> that I I, that that makes sense to me. I think that's a great north star. Switching to Taylor, what advice would you give to someone looking to go into cybersecurity today? Because I get questions in my inbox, everybody from people who are also software engineers like yourself to people who are like Uber drivers and stuff. Um, my advice is number one, get on Reddit. <laughs> I may suggest get on Reddit, get on YouTube, get on TikTok, and look for people who are doing the roles that you may be interested in and look at their day in their life. Um, and also go to, if you're unsure of like what concept or tools to like learn and what certifications to get, look up the job descriptions for these roles, like on LinkedIn or mm -hmm. in and then tally up like what are like the most like requested tools and certifications that are um, offered. So that kind of gives you like at least a head start on like where to go. And that all falls under being resourceful. Um, no one can really give you a roadmap if, if that can lead you to six figures. If they're telling you that they're lying. <laughs> um, and I think that the last thing I will say is like don't be afraid to switch out resources that may not work for you. Um, cause maybe your learning style may be different. You might prefer videos or books or however, and just experiment and explore. And, uh, yeah, that'd be my advice. <laughs> thoughts from Adam. Um, well, a few thoughts. So first of all, it's, um, I, I'm happy to be in security. It's, it's a great field. Um, for me, the thing that appeals to me the most is that there's always learning opportunities. It's always changing. There's always new attacks. There's always new security products coming out. It, it's something you can't just like say, hey, I learned it and I'm good. It's you're, you're constantly challenged, you're constantly learning. So if that's something that appeals to people, then I'd say, give it a shot. Um, you'll probably like it. Um, in terms of getting in, um, I would just say start learning. Um, like I said, the, the hard skills are very important. If you can learn some Linux, if you can learn some programming, if you can learn some networking, those are all things that will serve you well and allow you to specialize once you get into security. Um, so having that platform definitely makes things a lot easier. Um, we, we talked about just that initial SOC job. If you understand some of those hard areas, that it would make a SOC role or honestly pretty much any role in security a lot easier, help you contextualize, help you provide value. Um, for people that want to get started, um, I, I would just say start learning as well. In addition to those hard skills, um, Hack the Box has some great content if you want to get in and just get into some attack and defense scenarios. And there's a lot of certifications, there's dedicated degrees. So there's options out there, um, a lot more than 
were available back when back in the webgo days uh, when i was learning so i'm a big hockey box fan too listening to greg i think for people who are just even trying to get into it you know i hear a lot of people say you have to go through help desk and that might be true um even looking at something like a managed service provider um i think for me i did a little stint with a managed service provider right out right after the military um and i thought it was really helpful uh because it gave me a wide range of topics products and and environments to look at and learn from constantly Uh, but i also didn't have to sit there and work at that same environment every day right um so you you get kind of trade-off on hey do i need to learn what i even want to do maybe i need to get a lot of experience in a lot of different ways really quickly something like that kind of a job might be helpful um but once you figure out what you want to do you potentially want to stay at a single position, a single job to learn really in depth in that position. Uh, I find myself, I'm more of a generalist than a specialist. Me too. Uh, and I've, I've learned a lot about a lot of different things. I do kind of generally steer towards networking and security, but even that's a pretty large field. Um, and I don't know everything. Uh, I never will. And that's okay with me. Um, so sometimes just getting a little okay with that. Um, but it's, it's constantly... A learning thing. Advice from Oscar. For someone that does not come from any type of adjacent technical field, like they're outside of IT or OT, something like that, of course, it's going to be a challenge. Um, I'd say it's a it's a combination of first, you want to get your mindset right, right? Like you have to mm, have yep. the right mindset where you're an, an accountable person, right? Security is all about accountability. Then um, and then you have to think that it's since it's an adversarial nature and that threats can come from anywhere you want to be open-minded so you come in with those two things now the next thing we want to solve is your technical aptitude well that can be solved a variety of ways um i would suggest someone coming in from nowhere like maybe doing something similar to what i am doing maybe find one of these it jobs get whatever skills you need i personally don't think that getting a bunch of certs and thinking you're getting a job will help you uh that may be controversial um (laughs) i think maybe earnings uh, an easy cert you know like security plus will help because it gets you that holistic view you know like you kind of kind of see it at once it's a it's a good shortcut to you know youtubing all day and just throwing darts so that'll help you focus on it um so that person once they get into it they can figure it out from there right like you break through the pack and then you have some vision uh, someone that's already in IT, especially a software engineer, someone someone that like types code or is an SRE, they will, I believe they'll have a much easier shot. It's just for them, it's a matter of identifying the right people, getting that mindset, understanding, you know, the the weird cultural aspects from one field to another, and just going after it and being very determined, but not so, but um. Also not being uh, p- putting yourself down if you don't immediately succeed. It may take a couple of years, right? Like uh, for, for about a year or two, I was thinking, hey, maybe this security thing is cool. And I didn't, I didn't see a lot of opportunities. But uh-huh. once, it, once one opened up, I was ready. So that's why I emphasize mindset so much. You know, like you could be given a pl- a sil- everything on a silver platter, but if your head's not right, it's, if it's not in the game, you're, going, you're not going to see yep. the opportunities for what they are. Absolutely. And you mentioned the IT experience. We talked about this a little bit on LinkedIn. Um, why do you mention uh, starting out in IT and not just going straight for a cybersecurity role? Um, I, I think the barrier to entry may be pretty high, right? I, I try to identify myself with, with that particular question. If I were a hiring manager, right, it, it would be a little difficult because there there are a lot of you know, new entrants into cybersecurity. They may have the hookup. They may know someone. They may already have a little bit more experience than you. You know, you're you're hedging your bets. When you have that experience, you're you're adding to your profile, right? So, like, I go back to the storytelling again. If your story tells me, "Hey, I have the mindset. I I, I had like one of these two skills, and the only difference between me and this other person is that maybe in six months, you know." I'll, uh, I'll have just as much skills as them, but how will it look in about a year or two with my mm-hmm. mindset, my ability to learn, my enthusiasm? That's the difference maker. So it, it varies from people to people. And so having that technical, a little bit of that technical background, it just hedges your bet just a little bit more. 
and wrapping it up with Jose. I think uh, the thing people need to, you know, kind of understand and keep it in the grasp is that it's a marathon. It's a continuous changing environment. It's an industry that was looked at, you know, kind of not as a professional industry, but has now changed gears into becoming, you know, on the same level as accountants, uh, doctors, mm. things like that, right? It's becoming a professional, professional um, style of of work, not just kind of one of those things that, oh yeah, it's just IT. It's, you know, it's getting some backing behind it. And the other thing, right, is just starting it. Just go ahead and do it. You know, it's daunting at first, but pick a spot and, you know, hammer away and, and just keep working. All right. So we've heard from several people during this episode from a variety of backgrounds in cybersecurity who took different paths and have some different philosophies on things. Uh, you know, several people or a handful of people who came from IT and network engineering, folks who came from software engineering, and we've even got someone who went straight into cyber. Um, I think that the greatest takeaway that I have gotten from doing these interviews is that uh, cybersecurity isn't necessarily an entry level role. It definitely has at least some supplementary or foundational skills required in order to be successful. So keep that in mind, even as you have your eye on the prize in cybersecurity is, you know, what can you understand about uh, IT and tech and uh, computers and how applications work uh, before you jump into the cyber journey? Um, we've gotten lots of resources shared with us. I'm going to make sure all of those are in the description below. And uh, in general, I wish you luck. You know, this is what Cybersecurity Awareness Month is all about, right? And it's the fact that uh, we need more people in cybersecurity. We need more a diversity of thought in cybersecurity. And, um, you know, some of these folks have been doing this for years. Some of them have uh, become quite expert at what they do. Uh, but at one point, they were like you, looking to get into the field or maybe getting thrust in somehow. Um, and and I, I am one of those folks, right? Same thing happened to me. I came from a software engineering background. Um, I've worked a little bit as a network engineer. And, and somehow I've ended up uh, supporting security products and needing to become an expert in DevSec. So uh, thank you so much again for being here today. Drop all of your questions in the comments. Let us know what other questions you have for our guest. And uh, until next time, subscribe for more episodes of the DevSec Voice. Ciao.